I was married for six years and go by the name Liam. I've always been good at tinkering and making things, and it turned out that a lot of people were interested in what I came up with. I even have a couple of patents for some cool products. When I sold those patents, I decided to play it safe and put the proceeds into a trust fund until I could figure out what to do next. I had just concluded a three-year term in the army as a medical equipment maintenance technician when I was 22. During my time in the military, I acquired a passion for working with and repairing machinery. So, during the day, I worked fixing bakery equipment at a wholesale bakery, and at night, I studied for my degree in electrical engineering. On top of that, I was dating some females from my high school days as well as some I met after leaving the service. I was in a local lounge on a Friday night, nursing a beer and taking in the atmosphere. By chance, I noticed one of my co-workers sitting in a booth with a couple other girls. Because the bar was full, I summoned the confidence to ask if I might join them. I slid into the booth after obtaining the go-ahead from everyone and introduced myself to Oliver, who then introduced me to her boothmates, Mia and Mason. Mia immediately drew my attention. Mason, on the other hand, didn't quite click with me. I wasn't very fond of her. We just didn't get along. She wasn't mean in any way. We simply did not have that relationship. Mia gently slid over so I could sit in the booth next to her, and Oliver and I caught up on our lives outside of work. I tried to talk to Mason, but it seemed like we were speaking in different languages. We just couldn't seem to agree on anything. Mia was entirely concentrated as I attempted to strike up a discussion with Mason. However, it became clear that my efforts had been in vain. Mia then asked me to move so she could use the bathroom. As the ladies gathered for a committee meeting, I found myself alone in the booth. At the very least, they entrusted me with the responsibility of keeping an eye on their purses. Oliver returned after the conference and quickly gathered her and Mason's luggage. She informed Mia and me that Mason was sick and that she was taking her home. This left me alone with Mia for a few moments, creating an uneasy environment. I asked her if she wanted to go or if I should. She dismissed both alternatives and thanked me for my attempt to speak with Mason. Mason had discovered her fiancé cheating on her with an ex-girlfriend, which had temporarily raised her opinion of all males. From then on, Mia and I talked as if we were the only two people in the room. After a couple of hours of beer and pizza, I persuaded her to share her phone number with me, promising to call her. As we were getting ready to depart, I offered her a ride, but she declined because she had her own car parked nearby. She hadn't shown up with Oliver. I called her the next day, and we planned a date for the next weekend. We went to see a play at a local theater, which was Mia's first time seeing a live performance. She became an instant fan. We had a late dinner together after the performance, which was fantastic and led to further dates. We eventually became exclusive and were dating until I finished my degree. I got a job as an assistant engineer at a nearby electrical contracting company and proposed to Mia. She gladly accepted. We married 18 months later. Mason was the maid of honor, while Oliver was a bridesmaid. It was a lovely wedding, and the reception was full of pleasure and laughter. I've stated it before, but I've been a tinkerer since high school. I even had a few patents for bakery and commercial restaurant equipment, which the company welcomed. To manage it all, I launched my own business while working as a construction electrical engineer. I made certain that all funds were deposited into a company account. So I had something entirely mine. I was able to purchase the house we were renting through the firm. For almost three years, everything was going swimmingly. Mia found new work in the neighborhood after I was appointed to lead engineer on a big construction project. She thought it was the ideal moment to start a family because we were financially secure. We tried everything to make her pregnant, but nothing worked. After two years, we eventually went to a doctor, who determined that my sperm count was extremely low owing to an injury I sustained while serving in the military, 
and the sperm I generated wasn't modal. Mia became agitated, and our sexual life came to an end. It was as if a switch had been flipped. I put up with that for nearly seven months before reaching my breaking point. I sat down with her and told her I was leaving. You've made it apparent that you no longer desire intimacy with me. It's not my fault that I can't conceive. If having children is more important to you than our marriage, we should think about obtaining a divorce. She began crying, saying she didn't want a divorce and didn't want me to leave, that she's just so disappointed that we won't have children, that she forgot how much I meant to her, and that she'll try to be better in the future. That, I said, would not address our difficulties. Your attempts to be better are just as problematic as what we're going through right now. I don't want you to attempt it. I want you to sincerely want to get better. I'll be close by. And if you ever need anything, just give me a call. I propose that we undergo marriage counseling. If you are not willing to do so, you should consider seeking counseling for yourself. I adore you, and I'm not going simply because we haven't been intimate. But I can't bear being near you while your agony is bringing me so much pain. I eventually concluded my speech. She pauses for a moment before asking, where are you going? What are your plans? When are you going to return? How will you know if I improve? Please do not depart. I told you I'd answer your inquiries. Loved one, I will remain in the city, continue working, and never abandon you. However, I need to be away for a while. Your suffering is hurting me so much that I'm scared it may turn into fury. My mother has offered me a place to stay in the apartment above her garage, and your parents have offered me an apartment in their building. I won't be far away. Please seek assistance. I can't take the misery you're inflicting on me. When I am convinced that you love me sufficiently not to flinch when I touch you, I will return. She wailed, buried her head, and then snapped at me. Fine. You're a jerk. When things get tough, you should go. Simply leave. I'm going to see a lawyer before I see a therapist. Simply leave. These were the words of a woman who would never curse. I was stunned. I rose to my feet. I entered my bedroom and began packing my possessions. As I packed, tears flowed down her cheeks. I packed my car and connected the tiny trailer that we used for camping. It wasn't quite halfway filled, but I hoped I wouldn't be gone for too long. I drove for about 20 minutes until I arrived at my mother's house and began unpacking. After a few hours, my mother approached me and informed me that Mia was on the phone. But after that last dispute, I requested that she kindly take a message or call my cell phone. I don't think I'm ready for anything else right now. Mom, I'm sorry you're caught in the middle of this, I said. I adore Mia, but even getting a simple kiss from her has become difficult. I'm not sure if you want to hear this, but we haven't been intimate since we discovered I can't have children. Mia wants to start a family, and I even offered to divorce her if it would make her happy. I'm at a loss for words. I'm hoping that moving out will wake her up to the agony she's causing. If not, I may be staying for a while. I kissed my mother goodnight and went to bed. The next day at work, two police officers arrived at the construction site and requested to talk with me. They claimed to be investigating the previous night's burglary at my house. I was taken aback. They indicated that at approximately 3 a.m., someone attempted to break into my house through the basement window. My wife had dialed 911, and when the cops arrived, the intruder had vanished. They inquired as to why someone would choose to break into my home. I told them about the many gadgets I had and the ones I was working on right now. I informed them that I had moved away temporarily and that I would return home that night to analyze the issue. They then broke the unexpected news that your wife had to be admitted to the hospital. She appears to have had a psychotic episode. She is not in danger, but the patrolman who responded to the call stated that she was inconsolable. 
She is currently in the hospital's psychiatric ward. She requested that the man she was with leave the house. I'll see her as soon as possible. Don't be concerned about my belongings. They're not worth a single one of her hairs. I had reassured them. Please extend my appreciation to all the cops involved. I'll do all in my power to remedy these concerns. I wasn't aware there was a male with her during the incident until the next day. When I got to the hospital, I was told that I was on the list of excluded guests and would not be able to see Mia. When I asked who prepared the list, they told me that Mia and the physicians had collaborated. My wife had put me on the excluded list, much to my chagrin. I was enraged. That's when I decided that enough was enough. I went back to my flat and cried for a bit before choosing to act. I first contacted the hospital and asked to speak with a doctor. He swiftly returned my call and informed me that I was no longer eligible to receive medical updates. This fueled my rage even more. I then called her parents and informed them of the situation. They voiced their dissatisfaction with her activities and promised to keep me updated. I reviewed the previous several days' events and stated how her actions had caused me to believe that moving out was the best decision. I dialed my mother's number after leaving Mia's parents to attend to their own concerns. She had worked as a paralegal before retiring, so I asked her for recommendations on a competent divorce lawyer. I said that Mia had entirely cut me out of her life and that my actions might persuade her to seek help. I offered that she get a divorce and have the children she claimed to want. My mother reluctantly gave me the name of a lawyer. I thanked her and let her get back to her work. I decided to take matters into my own hands and requested a copy of the police report for my insurance. They said it would be ready in a half hour, but I had to go pick it up myself. Due to legal constraints, it appears that electronic transfer was not an option. Something didn't add up when I got the report. The damaged window was only 6 inches high and 24 inches wide, making passage difficult. Furthermore, there were only little tracks around the window, which could have belonged to a female or a youngster. To make matters further worse, at 3 a.m., there was another guy in the house named Ethan who was clad in a robe in addition to Mia. I recognized the name Ethan, but I couldn't pinpoint where I'd heard it before. According to the report, neither Mia or Ethan saw who attempted to break in, but Mia was furious that both of their identities were included in the police report. It suddenly clicked. I remembered Ethan working as a sales associate at her company, where I had met him earlier. I also remembered that his wife was the company's owner. What was he doing at my residence at such an unusual hour? I called the lawyer the next day, expecting a guy, but it was a woman who answered. I made a meeting with her for later in the day. I immediately called my employer and informed them that my assistant would handle everything while I took the rest of the week off for personal reasons. My supervisor called me back right away, requesting that I come to work right away. I explained the gravity of the issue, and he agreed to give me the time off. When I got to the lawyer's office, I asked for a divorce and a lawsuit against Mia and Ethan's workplace. I also requested a possible eviction notice because the house belonged to my firm, and Mia had no ownership interest in it. We were simply renting it from the firm I had formed to showcase my patents and inventions. I said that I had a police record showing Mia had a mail at her residence at 3 a.m. I also mentioned that I had temporarily left due to certain disagreements between us. And, by chance, the dude was there on the same night I departed. She informed me that my insurance would pay for Mia's necessary 14-day hospital stay. She stated that the medical information ban would be lifted only if I authorized payment. She then urged that I return to the house right away. She also urged me to contact the bank and request that withdrawal limits be imposed on all joint accounts and any joint ATM cards be cancelled. After completing all of the banking tasks, I went home to find Ethan attempting to enter. I blocked his path by parking my car in the driveway, and he began approaching me. As a result, 
I dialed the non-emergency police number on my cell phone and asked to speak with an officer. I shook my head no as Ethan approached and motioned for me to roll down the window, instead showing him my ID from my wallet. When he saw this, he bolted down the road. I laughed and asked the officer if they knew anything about the damage done by the break-in at my residence. They informed me that the only damage was a broken window that an inebriated neighbor unintentionally caused by walking into the driveway. When her key didn't fit the door, she smashed the window and left. So she called the police station the next day and agreed to pay for the damages. When I entered the house and proceeded into what had been our bedroom, I discovered a man's clothes in the dresser drawers that I had previously emptied. I went through every closet and drawer gathering clothes that did not belong to me. I went out to the garage, where we had our secret, absolutely illegal incinerator, with a stockpile in hand. I left the garage door open in anticipation of Ethan's return. And then, as I was flinging the last load into the raging pit, he emerged. As he approached the door, a smile spread across my face. I approached him, inquisitive about his plans. He simply shook his head and entered the garage after observing my antics. He said, I suppose I deserve it. I assumed Mia was divorced. She claims you dumped her for another woman six months ago. I replied. So you assumed you'd be able to move in. Let me set the record straight. I'm the one who pays the rent on this place, and Mia hasn't contributed anything. She has no right to it. I walked out three days ago due to a temporary disagreement with my wife, and believe me when I say that your wife's company will be hearing from my attorney shortly. I couldn't help but giggle when his face grew pale. By the way, when you visit Mia, please advise her that all of her stuff will be moved to her parents' home after she is released. Oh, and tell her I've finally figured out why she's frozen. I screamed one more time, unable to contain my rage. How long have you been having affairs with my wife? As I opened the gate for him, he remained silent and quickly got into his car. After he drove away, I went back to my house and contacted a locksmith. I finished the afternoon by making copies of the police report. Just in case, I created a copy for my insurance company. Another duplicate was produced for Mia's parents in case they tried to pin everything on me. Then I put a duplicate in our basement safe. I intended to retain the original in my personal safe deposit box at the bank. I had all of the patent paperwork in that box, as well as a bank book where I kept the money I made from patent licensing agreements. The money from my employment and roughly 10% of the patent money were in our joint accounts, and that's all Mia knows about. It's not much, but it should suffice for her if we ever divorce. I kept the concealed money because I wanted it all to myself. Mia discovered the house, so she would be unable to claim it in a divorce. However, it was not a deal-breaker. I spent the next morning packing up all of her clothes, makeup, toiletries, and any pictures that did not contain me. We had some crates lying around that we dismantled and used for this purpose. The locksmith arrived in the early afternoon and changed the locks. Following that, I delivered all of the boxes to her parents' apartment building and provided them with a copy of the police report. They weren't delighted, but they took the stuff nonetheless. I departed without saying anything else. My lawyer responded and assured me that the fear of non-payment was sufficient to collect full medical information. Mia was about six weeks pregnant at the time and was frightened when she knew the cops would find out about Ethan's presence at the residence. She yelled at the officers who arrived to investigate the break-in. She eventually began shouting and wailing uncontrollably. Officers had to restrain her, and they took her to a 14-day psychiatric evaluation. Unfortunately, she miscarried the baby, which pushed her even further. The physicians wanted to detain her for 90 days since she was on the verge of suicidal ideation. Her hormone levels were also increased, as if she had been on fertility drugs. They were unable to locate any prescriptions from the doctors she claimed were treating her. The pregnancy news was the final straw for me. 
I told my lawyer that once Mia was released from the hospital, I wanted the divorce papers served on her. I told my lawyer that I had fertility problems and that the few sperm I have are destroyed. I also urged her to pursue legal action against the corporation right away due to their rigorous anti-fraternization policy. I advised her to make it a difficult procedure for them, but not to go too far. Both were to be sacked without any recommendation or severance package as part of the deal. The case was soon launched against the corporation, and Ethan's wife alerted my lawyer, via her lawyer, that they were prepared to battle. My lawyer advised the opposing counsel that they had evidence of both parties' unprofessional behavior. Despite not mentioning the pregnancy, she did bring up the police report of Ethan being at the house at 3 a.m. M. This fact took the company's attorney off guard because his client had omitted to address it. My lawyer thought that she might not have known. When the lawyer heard her name, he recommended a settlement. A resolution was reached after the lawyers reconvened. I received a considerable sum of money, and Ethan and Mia were both fired from their jobs. Based on the police report, Ethan's wife filed for divorce. He then lied to her, saying he was going to a customer site that night in order to get an early start. I learned about it from one of Mia's co-workers at the office. Mia was released from the hospital before the commitment papers were signed. Following that, she was served with divorce papers. She disappeared, and I hadn't heard from her in over a year. However, she did sign and return the divorce papers. But she made no demands from the marriage, not even her rightful portion. She sent me an apology letter around 15 months later. It traveled all the way from a small village in Montana. She didn't reveal anything about her life since the divorce. The letter was simply her way of apologizing for the pain she had caused me.